Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ajit. Um, I run a company called Invention Labs. I'm not going to talk to you about my company today, but I'm going to talk to you about the experience I had in inventing this device that you see here. It's called Avaaz. Avaaz, as all of you know, stands for speech in many languages all over the world. And um, this device that we built, um, it's for people with disabilities, people with speech disabilities, people who can't speak. We wanted to give a voice to these people. I'm going to tell you about how we went about inventing this device, what kind of problems we faced, what we're planning to do in the future, what kind of response we've had, and the kind of engineering challenges that, you know, I think a lot of engineers can take away from what we did. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, let me first tell you about the problem itself. I mean, um, we don't really see a lot of disabled people in India because you don't include them in our society as much as in some other societies. But there are, you know, several millions of people in India and all over the world really who live behind this wall of silence. They can't speak. Now, um, this can be because of various reasons, you know. It can be because of cerebral palsy, because of autism, because of mental retardation, because of being hearing impaired and so on. And because they can't speak, like I'm speaking to you now, they can't communicate. Because they can't communicate, they're really excluded from the bulk of society. They can't, they can't get a good education, they can't get employment, so all of those things. So this was the problem that I chose to tackle when I started this company, Invention Labs. Now, why can't these people communicate? Um, even though we think that it's just because you know, there's something wrong with the way they create speech, for example, the, the reasons that people can't communicate are actually myriad. There are many of them. Um, for example, people with cerebral palsy, you know, what, what we typically call spastic. Um, when they are born, or just before or just after they are born, um, they have damage to the part of the brain that controls muscle movements. It's called the primary motor cortex. I don't think you can see it up there, but it's, it's in the front. It's about here, right? So, if you are damaged in the primary motor cortex, you can't move very accurately. And if you can't move accurately, you can't do all of this magic that's happening in my throat and my lips and my tongue which is allowing me to speak, right? So they're very intelligent, so they, they have normal intelligence for all other matters. It's just that that doesn't get actualized as speech. And in fact, it's worse than that because for many of these people, they can't use their hands very fluently. So they can't write, they can't type, right? So they have no way of communicating, they can't use sign language. So they're actually behind this wall of silence. And for people with other disabilities, for example, autism, which is very, very poorly understood. They're only beginning to understand what autism is. The problem is not because of muscle movement, but because there's a certain section in the brain which controls communication, which controls social development, which controls imagination, right? And this part of the brain gets affected. It's very difficult for us to put ourselves in their shoes, but they just don't have the urge to talk, right? They don't get this language, linguistic conversion of words, ideas into words, words into speech. That gap is there. That's autism. For people with mental retardation, there's a damage to the primary cortex, which is the part which deals with cognitive ability. So they can't think with the same level of cognition that all of us can do. And a lot of people with hearing impairment, you know, the, what's typically called deaf mute, they can't speak because they don't hear. So that impairs their language acquisition skills. So these are the various problems that I sought to tackle using the device that I built. What did I do? I built a device called Avaaz. You can see uh, an older version of Avaaz. This is the new version of Avaaz. It's, uh, it's something that you can carry around with you. And um, you can use that to communicate. So what it does in a very broad sense is it converts muscle movements into speech. Right? So there are some people who have a lot of muscle movement and who need speech. For example, people with hearing impairment. So for people like that, it's just a touch screen device. So you can touch different, different things on the screen, different options, and then it speaks it out. There are some people for whom that's not possible, for example, cerebral palsy. So this device also senses muscle movements which are much bigger, for example, my head shaking, for example, my leg shaking, right? We don't need accurate muscle movements. These movements are sensed and they're converted into messages which get converted into speech. The technique that converts them into messages is actually, to give you an analogy, it's very similar to what one would use in a cell phone, right? Like you have T9 in your cell phones. This is very predictive, 
it speeds up the way that you access things and the idea is to really get fast speech even though you have very limited input which is just one kind of movement which is also very coarse so that's the device so you know in a nutshell the technology is that it's a disabled friendly user interface with a speech synthesizer all of which is packaged into this compact form factor which people can carry around right so that's the invention that's the innovation really the biggest challenge that i had actually i haven't put the biggest challenge there the biggest challenge that i had is how do you get feedback about the product from people who can't speak to you right so i have all of these potential customers so to speak who can't communicate and i give them something and say okay what do you think do you think this product is good enough i don't know and then i started figuring out that if they communicate even if they tell me it's not good right it's like when i was a kid um, you know that this uh, you know somebody would suddenly shout from some place can you hear me and somebody else would shout no i can't <laughs> so that's the uh, that itself is the proof that you can communicate right so the moment they started giving me bad feedback i knew my device was actually working so <laughs> so um, but that was the biggest challenge right I, i i had to find out how to make something which is appropriate now we have devices that we use in our daily lives on a very off hand kind of a basis we we use it you know for a couple of hours a day or we use it for a few days and then we throw it away a voice is not like that you use a voice every day and you use it almost every moment that you're awake right so it has to be perfect right it has to be something that's very very well engineered and so that is where the majority of my efforts went we we designed all of these switches and we used you know all kinds of techniques for figuring out how to present options to the users we figured out how for example people with autism i told you they are very poor at language but they are very very strong visually they have extremely good visual memories they have extremely good retentivity of information that they see in the form of pictures so we developed an entire user interface which doesn't use alphabets but what we use is pictures right and we try to develop this entire system of communication using only pictures so that's what we did for autistic people um we you know we have children who have to walk around we have children who have to sit on a wheelchair we have children who are you know who have to lie down so we have to make mounting arrangements for all these things and all of this put together we wanted to make it at 5% of the cost that these devices were available abroad i mean when i was in the us i saw similar devices which were like 5 lakhs 10 lakhs obviously it's not affordable to people in india we wanted something which is maybe you know 20000 30000 so that was our price point also so all of this innovation with this price tag that came with it but it took us about 3 years to do it the way we did it was we were working with a school in chennai called vidya sagar so it was previously called the plastic society of india chennai so i would actually make a prototype sitting in my lab right we could have all these wires poking out and uh, i'd actually take it to them and show it to them and find out what feedback they had to give me then i'd go back to my lab and make a new one and take it there and then i used to show it to parents i used to show it to teachers it actually took me three years and six prototypes to come up with the first version which was actually working according to their desires it takes that much of time it's not a you know the the, the engineering is not rocket science but it takes a lot of time to make it work perfectly okay and that's that is my experience um there's a vision behind all of this and that vision is really to mainstream people with disabilities this this lady was the director of vidya sagar the school i just told you about and this is what she said she said communication is right away a human being the development of this avaaz is a boon etc etc so we've been very lucky because people like mental labs have come forward to work with us to develop these aids now you understand the catch here right the catch is that the reason that these kinds of things are not there in the market is not because it's super rocket science or whatever it's because there are no people who are looking at these particular problems now i would say in my experience as an engineer that 90% of engineering is really finding the right problem to find a solution to right usually once you find the problem it's a question of being good in studies you know talking to the right people getting to meet the right kind of engineers putting all of that together but there has to be a problem right which you have to pick and you have to pick a problem which is relevant to society which is useful to people and that's really where we got the appreciation that we did of course now the device is being used in, in several schools in several cities etc spastic society of karnataka the first logo over there which is based in karnataka in, in bangalore one of our earliest most faithful customers this is a little bit of what i'm what i'm doing now what my research is i 
figured out, right? I figured out the hard way. Communication is bloody complicated. I mean, it's one of the most complicated things that happen inside our brain. You know, I had a sense for this when I was in uh, when I was in college, and I was doing these two independent courses. You know, um, one on compression of music, like MP3 and all that. Another on compression of voice, which is what we use in telephony, like GSM, etc. And I was just, I couldn't believe how, the, how totally different the communication algorithms were, right? And I couldn't understand it. So I went and spoke to a professor of mine, uh, Professor Pascal Ramurthy, and uh, he told me, you know, you know, Ajit, the reason that this happens is because the algorithms that govern composition of music, they simulate the ear, right? And the algorithms that govern speech, they simulate the mouth, right? 